السلام عليكم After the release of the prior segment about Allahumma or about avoiding the use of Allahumma, we saw a clear distinction between those who follow the evidence from the Quran and totally submit to it versus those who are attached to what they learned from the forefathers, be it from hadith, be it from a teacher, be it from a sheikh or a preacher. The latter group is not fully free of shirk and I advise them to be careful because they are not able to detach themselves fully from anything outside the Quran. The primary objective of this channel is to enable you to have a direct connection with Allah, period. In order to do this, I have to first convince you to stop following blindly other human beings or reports that we have received from other human beings. To do this, I show you where the books of Tafsir and Sirah and Hadith made clear mistakes, either all of them or a subset of them. In that sense, this video segment is more important than prior video segments. It will illustrate how all the traditional non-Quranic sources made a big mistake, causing millions and millions to be misled from what the Quran truly told us. Be patient, this is big, and this is embarrassing to all of the opponents of this channel. If you are watching to find faults with this channel or with me personally, be warned, this segment might give you an existential crisis. But if you watch hoping to learn, there is good news, plenty of good news. Please purify your intention before you watch and ask Allah to guide you and all of us to the truth exclusively from Him. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. This segment is part 3.3 of the series that we've started a while ago now called Why No Stories? equal no Quran, how to extract Abrahamic locution from the dhikr, which is all the Quranic stories and the parables that are in our beautiful Quran. The title for this segment is Who was Ismail according to the Quran, not according to other sources. How we were taught the wrong story of Ismail for 14 centuries. Please watch the prior segments if you have not done so. You're not going to benefit as much from this segment. And you're going to have a lot of questions that were answered already in prior segments. Remember, this is not for entertainment purposes. This is a heavy-duty academic presentation. It includes a lot of technical details, a lot of references to the Quranic ayat and verses, and concepts that we've presented before. So please be fair to yourself and fair to this channel and save yourself the trouble of asking questions that have already been answered in prior segments. We will include several reminders and clarification in this segment, but they are not a substitute for watching the prior segments in this series and other concepts from the marvelous Quran. Please do not ask questions unless you have watched the whole full segment. I know it's long and I know it needs patience, but it's really worth it. So I promise you, if you invest your time, invest your energy in watching, you will learn a lot. In this segment, we will start with the traditional story of Ibrahim and Ismail, specifically focusing on Ismail. We will discuss the dissonance in the traditional account about Ismail, dissonance in the sense that it does not match what the Quran actually tells us. We will include a reminder about the concept of markings, which we've discussed in prior segments. Again, this is not sufficient, but just to remind you, a reminder about the principle of intentionality. And I hope that you will also stay with us all the way to the end, because this segment is going to be a huge application of what it means to say and to witness and to testify, La ilaha illallah. We will include a brief reminder about that, inshallah, before we start presenting the evidence of who Ismail was.
we will have a lot of primary evidence. We will also have a lot of secondary evidence. All of them from the Quran. We're not going to introduce anything from outside the Quran. We will also proceed as per the methodology that we follow, which is the organic Quranic methodology. We will proceed to verify that our conclusions fit every observation from the Quran. Nothing is going to be left out. We're not going to forget about any part or any mention that relates to the story of Ismail in the Quran. We will discuss the traditional story of Hagar or Hajar as a foundational story supposedly for the Arabs of Mecca. We will also talk about as Safa and Marwa and what that means to us. We will answer briefly the question, is Ismail the Ghulam Halim that is described in the Quran or is Ishaq the Ghulam Alim? We will discuss various beautiful good news at the end of this segment. Make sure you don't miss it. We also have a very important discussion on the implications of all of this. And finally, what you should do with this information. So I hope you stick around all the way to the end. If you need to take a break, take a break, but make yourself a good cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Find a quiet corner to watch without interruption. Get a pen and a paper or a journal as I recommend. And let's get started right away, inshallah. We start with the traditional story of Ibrahim. The traditional story of Ibrahim has nothing to do with the Quran. I'm just reminding you of what they taught us. They taught us a story about Ibrahim and Ismail that we're going to summarize just to refresh our memory. This is not the story that the Quran gave us. This is the story we were taught by the books of Tafsir and by the books of Hadith and by the Shaykh and the scholars, etc., etc. We will see more where these stories came from. But first, let me summarize the story just to refresh your memory about what we were taught, this foundational story about Ismail. The source of the story started originally from what we refer to as the corrupted version of the Torah, plus some narrations. Again, we're going to discuss them in detail. The story goes that Ibrahim was a man who was married to Sarah or Sarai as reported in the Bible. And she was a noble woman and a very beautiful woman. And Ibrahim was cast away by his people. He was driven out from his town. And so he traveled with Sarah to a distant land, reportedly Egypt. But there is no evidence for this, as we shall see. On his way, a powerful king coveted Ibrahim's wife, Sarah, and wanted to take her from him. Sarah was taken to the king, but she made a dua to keep the king away from her. This worked for three times, the dua that she made. Each time the king passed out when she made the dua. After the third time, we were told the king gave up, sent Sarah back to Ibrahim, and gave her a concubine, a slave woman, named Hajar or Hagar or Agar, we will see. Sarah could not bear children, so she asked Ibrahim to sleep with Hajar or Hagar, her slave woman, in order for Ibrahim to have a child. Hajar delivered Ismail, that's what we were told. After a while, Sarah became jealous and asked Ibrahim to exile Hajar and Ismail into a faraway land. Ibrahim took Hajar and Ismail to Mecca, supposedly, and abandoned them there without any food or shelter, where later the eruption of Zamzam happened, the well of the water in Mecca called Zamzam. The incident of the slaughtering dream took place, which we discussed in a separate video. We will talk more about this aspect a little later. And then the building of the Kaaba happened. This part was added, of course, to the main story by our own Mufassirun. The biblical authors or the authors of the corrupted version of the Torah did not say that, of course. But our Mufassirun had to put a Muslim veneer on the story that relates to some of the verses in the Quran. And so they added this part based on their reading of the Quran. As a result of Ismail and Hajar living in Mecca, of course, the Arabs became the descendants of Ismail. Later on, back in her home, 
Sarah bore a child, Ishaq. It was a miraculous birth, of course, for Ibrahim. And Ishaq, we were told, grew up later to have his own son, Yaqub. Allah favored the lineage of Ishaq. That's what we were told in the corrupted version of the Torah, not the lineage of Ismail. And of course, our Mufassirun disagreed with this. Why did the corrupted version of the Bible say this? Because Hajar was a concubine woman. She was a slave woman. And therefore, her descendants are not worthy of being selected by Allah to receive any direct guidance. This is what we were told. Our Mufassirun disagreed. So in other words, the story that we were taught as children and continue to be taught by the books and the preachers confirm most of the biblical story. They disagreed on a couple of minor issues as we just saw. So the dissonance in this traditional erroneous claim about Ismail stems from the fact that in the Quran, in several ayat, in several verses, the Quran mentions Ibrahim along with his descendants, Ishaq and Yaqub, but fails to mention Ismail. In other words, Ismail is missing from the picture as we see in eight different locations in the Quran. So either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgot about this, or there must be a real valid justification for why the Quran is drawing our attention to the fact that Ismail was not in the picture. Remember, the title of this segment is who Ismail really was according to the Quran. So these are observations that we must pay attention to and find reasonable explanations as to why the Quran did this. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not include Ismail among the descendants of Ibrahim? So we're going to go very quickly. The first instance from Surah Yusuf, ayah number 6. وَكَذَلِكَ يَشْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِن تَأْوِيلِ الْحَدِيثِ وَيُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ كَمَا أَتَمَّهَا عَلَىٰ أَبَوَيْكَ مِن قَبْلُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَاقِ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ This is supposedly Yaqub talking to his son Yusuf and he's telling him and thus your Lord shall make you someone to whose supplication Allah responds and teaches you through the interpretation of discourses and completes his favor upon you and upon Yaqub's followers. This is a person who's speaking, meaning upon my own followers, just as he completed it upon your two spiritual forefathers before Ibrahim and Ishaq. Pay attention. Your two spiritual forefathers before Ibrahim and Ishaq. Well, where is Ismail? This is Yaqub speaking, supposedly a very close descendant of Ibrahim. How come he did not mention Ismail as one of the forefathers of Yusuf? This is the first question. The second occurrence is from Surah Yusuf, Ayah 38 again. This is Yusuf speaking, this time in prison, and he's talking to the two prison mates that he had. وَاتَّبَعْتُ مِلَّةَ آبَائِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبِ and I followed the Milla, we will talk about Milla in a future segment, inshallah, of my forefathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. Again, he stopped short of mentioning anything about Ismail. Where is Ismail? He's not in the picture. Item number three. This is from Surah Maryam, Ayah 49. This is talking about Ibrahim. When he sequestered himself away from them, he left them. He departed away from his people who drove him away and abandoned everything else they worshipped as intermediaries between themselves and Allah. We, meaning Allah, granted him Ishaq and Yaqub and we made both of them prophets. Where is Ismail? Item number four. This is also talking about Ibrahim. This is from Surah 21, Ayah 72, Surah Al-Anbiya. We saved him or safeguarded him and loot with him to the Ard, to the scripture or to the land in any way you want to interpret this. And then, 
وَكُلَّنْ جَعَلْنَا صَالِحِينَ And we granted him Ishaq and Yaqub. Again, no Ismail. Number five. فَآمَنَ لَهُ لُوط وَقَالَ إِنِّي مُهَاجِرٌ إِلَى رَبِّي إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَجَعَلْنَا فِي ذُرِّيَّتِهِ النُّبُوَّةَ وَالْكِتَابِ etc. So in here, this ayah from Surah Al-Ankabut, Surah 29, Ayah 27, and we granted him Ishaq and Yaqub. Again, this is talking about Ibrahim. Where is Ismail? In Surah Sad, this is number 6. وَاذْكُرْ عِبَادَنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبُ أُولِي الْأَيْدِي وَالْأَبْصَارِ إِنَّا أَخْلَصْنَاهُمْ بِخَالِصَةٍ ذِكْرَ الدَّارِ وَإِنَّهُمْ عِنْدَنَا لَمِنَ الْمُصْطَفِينَ الْأَخْيَارِ وَاذْكُرْ إِسْمَعِيلَ وَالْيَسَعَ وَذَا الْكِفْلِ وَكُلٌّ مِنَ الْأَخْيَارِ So at the beginning of this paragraph, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Sad 38-45, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. All three typical mention of the three together. And then after three other ayah in ayah 48, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ismail along with two relatively unknown prophets. We don't know who they really are. il and the kifl Those two prophets are not mentioned that much in the Quran and Ismail is mentioned along with them, not along with Ibrahim and Ishaq and Yaqub. Hmm, very questionable, very interesting observation. Number seven, this is the scene where the angels came to Ibrahim, visiting him and gave his woman, his subordinate woman, the good news of having progeny. So, وَامْرَأَتُهُ قَائِمَةٌ فَضَحِكَتْ فَبَشَّرْنَاهَا بِإِسْحَاقٍ وَمِنْ وَرَاءِ إِسْحَاقَ يَعْقُوبٍ Ayah 1171, this is from Hud, details the prophecy given to Ibrahim and his subordinate woman regarding Ishaq and Yaqub without any mention of Ismail. And this was good news. In other words, this is something they really wanted. They were desperate for this, especially the woman, supposedly Sarah, but the Quran doesn't mention the name of the woman of Ibrahim. We go back to the final item in the list of dissonance in the traditional erroneous claim about Ismail. Ismail and Ibrahim were not together. No. I know you're going to point to Surah Al-Baqarah, but this is item number eight in the list of dissonance items. In this paragraph, we're going to deal with this paragraph again and again, but I just want to focus on one specific ayah, which is typically used by those who claim that Ismail was with Ibrahim in Mecca. Pay attention because the details are really crucial and it's very relevant that we understand exactly what the ayah is saying. So the ayah is ayah 2.127 from Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ As Ibrahim, as Ibrahim, is elevating or raising al-qawa'idah min al-bayt. I'm not going to translate this right now because it's really different than what we expect. And we will discuss this in a future segment. So for now, they're elevating or they're raising something. Between parentheses, the translators and the interpreters said Ibrahim was raising al-bayt, meaning the house, that's wrong. And based on the foundations of the house. In other words, the interpreters and then translators said, Ibrahim was raising the house based on the foundation. This is the exact opposite of the Arabic says, Al-Qawa'idah min al-bayt. Ibrahim is raising the foundations of the house, not the house based on the foundations. So they twisted and switched the order of the words in order to fit their preconceived notion that Ibrahim built the Kaaba in Mecca. This is not what this ayah is saying. We will deal more, inshallah, in the future about what this ayah specifically is talking about. But for now, this is not what matters to us in this segment. What matters to us is that Ibrahim is the subject of this verb, yarfa'u, to elevate. So Ibrahim was raising, right? Was raising something, al qawaida min al-bayt. Wa ismailu, this little dhamma on top right here, 
I'm going to enlarge it so you can all see it very well. This little Dhamma in here, this little Dhamma indicates that Ismail is also a subject of the verb Yarfa'u. So Yarfa'u, Ibrahim wa Ismailu. And they said, aha, uh -huh, they were together. And that's not necessarily true. So you need to be patient and accept that the Quran teaches us how we interpret this unique style. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not put Ismail right here? وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not do this. Allah separated part of the subject, Ismail, from the first part of the subject. So therefore, there are two people who are the subject of this verb, and they were separated by Al-Qawaida min al-Bayt. Again, we're not going to talk about Al-Qawaida min al-Bayt right now. We're going to leave it till another segment because it deserves its own segment. But we're just focused on this paragraph which talks about Ibrahim was elevating or raising along with Ismail. Now, along with Ismail is not really accurate as we will see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us just five ayat later another ayah that explains the style he used in this ayah. So in ayah 127, he split the two subjects referring to one verb, yarfa'u. In ayah 132, the exact same thing happened. وَوَصَّى بِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبُ Remember the Dhamma on the last letter, Ya'qubu. It's part of the subject. The subject of which verb? The verb wassa. In other words, wassa, that means he recommended or he reminded or he taught or he entrusted some learning, some teaching. Who? Ibrahim. Ibrahim is the first subject, just like Ibrahim is the first subject in here. So Ibrahim recommended to his bani, his children, his descendants, his students. It depends how you want to translate it. وَيَعْقُوبُ And Ya'qub did the same thing. Now, Ya'qub and Ibrahim were at the same time doing the same thing to the Bani of Ibrahim, the descendants or the children or the followers of Ibrahim. Of course not, they were separate. In other words, Ibrahim could not have been with Ya'qub doing this recommendation at the same time to the Bani, to the children or descendants of Ibrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separated Ya'qub as a subject from Ibrahim as also the subject to the same verb. So one verb followed by two subjects that are separated indicate that the subjects were not together. So it's two separate sentences joined by one verb, but they're really indicating two separate events, separate in time. I hope this is clear. This is so relevant. This is so critical. And if you understand the basics of Arabic, this structure in here of separating the first subject from the, f from the second subject is by itself a warning sign, a red flag that you should stop and ask, why? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this? And the answer is explained in this ayah, ayah 132, because this is two events, not just one, and they're separated in time. In other words, two different events, very similar. So Allah used the same structure, but separated the subject to indicate to us that these did not happen at the same time. In other words, Ismail and Ibrahim were not together as they were raising Al-Qawaida min al-Bayt. I hope this makes sense, but there is another, but there is more in here. Yarfa'u, yarfa'u is present tense. I want you to pay attention in here a little bit and start to get the hint of what's going on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this whole paragraph, again, I apologize. I'm not going to translate it in full. I'm only going to focus on what matters to this segment. Those of you who want to read the translation, the translations that are available generally are acceptable. So I'm not going to deal with the full translation of this paragraph. So we notice وَإِذْ إِبْتَلَى وَإِذْ إِبْتَلَى This is past tense. This is talking about Ibrahim in the past. وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا This is also past tense. وَإِذْ قَالَ Past tense. And suddenly you have 
وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ Present tense. Present tense. So Ibrahim obviously did it in the past when these ayat were revealed. But there is a present tense for the second subject. Who is the second subject? Question mark. We will see shortly, inshallah. So now we move to a few reminders about how we're going to apply the bayinat. If you remember, bayinat indicate the instruments of extracting evidence from the Quran so that we can learn from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us several concepts. One of them is the markings. We talked about the markings in a segment called Who Frowned and Refused to Answer the Blind Man, which is the series on Surah Abasa, part three. Please go back and revisit this. It's a series that's very rich with information, and I hope you go back to it and learn about the concept of markings. But the point is Allah placed markings in the Quran. So what are these markings? And we use the example in that series of the man who died 100 years. And we were talking about Abasa and we said there is a parable of the man who died 100 years. That parable, which is in Ayah 2, 259, was the stem that gave us links or markings to a number of stories in the Quran. And we talked about Surah Abasa, which is Surah 80, فَلْيَنظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ أَسْفَارًا This is from Surah 62 and from Surah 18 وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَىٰ عُرُوشِهَا and other stories. So there are many markings in this parable that teach us how to link this parable to many other stories and thus understand more about the parable itself and about the other stories that are linked. So these markings is like someone taking a highlighter and saying this part is related to that part. And this is a bayina. This is a way to extract evidence from the Quran that they did not teach us in the traditional books of tafsir. So Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to learn this technique. Please go back to the series and watch it if you are interested to learn more. We're going to make extensive use of this technique in this segment. This is a significant aspect of how we discover who Ismail truly was. The next reminder is the principle of intentionality. In other words, we said everything in the Quran is intentional. So when these markings happen and they link two different stories, especially using unique terms or unique expressions that don't occur anywhere else, these patterns, these links are intentional. Why are they important to us? Because if they are not intentional, that means there are coincidences. They happen at random. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not pay attention to using specific terms, specific expressions in two or more different places that are by coincidence not referring to the same thing. So a coincidence does not happen in the Quran. Coincidental patterns in the Quran do not exist. Why? Because a coincidence is an attribute of an imperfect being, imperfect author, but Allah is perfect. So if we see a pattern, we know this is not a coincidence. Is it enough to prove anything? No, it's a sign. It's a marking. We have to dig down and find additional evidence to confirm such markings or to understand the relationship of these two stories or two paragraphs that include such markings. In the past, we've included an example, Yabna Um and Ibn Um, and in one case, it's separate two words. In another case, it's connected as a single word in the writing of the Quran. And we said, this is evidence, this is a marking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes concatenates two words and makes a single word out of them. And this is evidence that taught us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to seek such things in the Quran. If you remember, we discussed this evidence in detail in the video titled, Does God Sit on a Throne? If this is your first segment on the channel, please stop right now and watch several other segments because you're not going to appreciate what we present in this segment unless you learn about the terminology and the vocabulary and the methods and the bayinat and all of the Abrahamic locution concepts that we've talked about before. So please don't be unfair to yourself 
or to the audience of this channel by writing comments, cursing something you don't understand. Please learn about these concepts before continuing with this segment. I urge you not to waste your time otherwise. So this is the principle of intentionality, and this is to be added to the principle of certainty, which means everything in the Quran is confirmed true. We cannot dismiss any part of it. And the principle of relevance, that means everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us in the Quran is relevant, it's something very important to us. We cannot say, ah, this is just average vanilla flavored type of information, stuffing of words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not do this in the Quran. So there's no stuffing, there's no doubtful information, no, everything is certain, everything is relevant, and there are no coincidental patterns in the Quran. These are extremely critical to understand the evidence that we're going to use next, inshallah, in this segment. Finally, one more reminder about the meaning of Tawheed. I've talked about this several times in prior segments. I want to read it because it's really critical that you understand what it means to say La ilaha illallah, Tawheed. Ever since this channel started a year and a half ago, I've been teaching the importance of relying on Allah alone to learn, of connecting with Allah alone, of letting the Quran teach us and lead us to the truth, allowing ourselves to submit to the words of Allah. I have been teaching that Allah is Al-Hakim, that means He's the source of linguistic discernment. And if you remember, we always reference this segment of a couple of ayat in the Quran, in al illa lillah. The word Al-Hukm does not mean governance. It means linguistic discernment, how to judge, how to discern the boundaries of the semantics of each term, of each word. So the active participle from the verb hakama or the gerund hakama is al-hakim, the source of linguistic discernment. They told us it's the wise one or that kind of thing. No, it's not. It is an Abrahamic locution that refers to Allah as the one who provides us the linguistic discernment. The same thing with al-wakil, the arbitrator over any confusion. And we talked about this in a segment that relates to the story of Yusuf in this same series. Please go back to it a few months ago. I also have been teaching consistently that Allah's book is the authoritative source and it dominates over all other sources. And therefore, whenever we learn from the Quran and we find something outside of the Quran contradicting what we have just learned, we have reason to dismiss that other thing and trust Allah, and trust the Qur'an. Either you trust Allah, or you don't trust Allah. Either you trust the words in the Qur'an, and you believe it has been preserved and given to us by Allah, or you don't. Choose, make a decision. You want to follow what you were taught, and you find some conflict in the Qur'an, and then you dismiss the Qur'an, you've just committed shirk. You've just associated Hakim, a source of discernment, over the Qur'an. Please be careful and don't take these things lightly. I'm not speaking and talking so that I misguide you. I'm telling you, focus on the Quran. Trust Allah and submit, taslim, submit to Allah. So I have often stated that Tawheed is not just about the oneness of Allah. That's a simple part of understanding Tawheed. One God. Yes, so what? One God. But I read from other sources, other human beings, other narrations. No. Tawheed means exclusivity of Allah as a source of guidance. No other source of guidance. None. All other human beings about whom we were taught receive their guidance from Allah. And we have access to Allah, to the words of Allah, to the process that I described, which is the separation of Ard and Samawat. And therefore we can directly connect ourselves to Allah and receive guidance. There is nothing preventing us from receiving direct guidance from Allah. This is what Islam is all about. Freeing us to connect only with Allah. No subservience to any other human beings. Any other human beings. I hope you take this message to heart. So our shahada is not Allahu Ahad. It's not just one God. Our shahada is La ilaha illallah. There is no deity or source of guidance except Allah. 
only Allah, exclusively Allah, no one else. Many of you have written, so what? Why don't you teach us about some practical things? I asked you, are you ready? And the majority of you said, yes, we are ready. And then I presented the Quranic evidence against using the word Allahumma in our supplication and dua. Quranic evidence, clear, very significant evidence, irrefutable evidence. And yet some people failed that very first test. Unfortunately, many found that video unacceptable. Some people who told me, yes, they are ready. Some people who were significantly committed to following the evidence from the Quran. So either we believe in the Quran or we don't believe in the Quran. Choose because this segment is going to really test you. It's going to really challenge you. And for some people, it's going to cause them to fall off the wagon. For some people, it's going to give them an existential crisis. They're going to have to revisit everything they were taught. I promise you, the evidence is this stunning, this irrefutable. You will see for yourself, inshallah. So without further ado, who was Ismail? Ismail was none other than our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whoa, really? Where did you get this from? We get this from... A lot of evidence that we're going to present in the rest of the segment. So I hope you go take wudu right now. Find a really quiet time and place to watch the rest of the segment. Take a deep breath. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the truth. And let's take a look at the evidence according to the methodology from the Quran. Exclusively from the Quran. We're not going to refer to anything else. We're not going to accept any other claims by any other human beings, we're going to allow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the direct evidence. The direct evidence consists of four primary clear Quranic evidence. Of course, there is more, but for the sake of time, I'm only including several evidence, but not all of them. There is two secondary Quranic evidence. There are six different Quranic ways we're going to use to verify our conclusion. So it's not just an idea, it's not just an opinion. We apply it to the observation and then we make sure all the other observations do not negate the conclusion we reached. This is what's called by Karl Popper, the refutability principle. In other words, if you make a claim about some new knowledge, some new discovery, you have to also provide people with a way to refute such claim. So that in the future, if someone discovers such a way to refute your claim, then your claim is bogus. We're going to do this homework. We're not going to leave it at just cherry picking some of the observations from the Quran that match our conclusion that Ismail is our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No, we're going to look at all the other evidence that may disprove and then we're going to explain them and see if they fit with this conclusion that we have reached with the theory and with the proposal that we're putting forth. And by the end, when all of this is said and done, you're going to be left with absolute conviction, confirmation, confidence that this is the correct result. Ismail is none other than our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just a quick warning. The last verification requires some patience, but reveals a lot of new information. So please be patient as you watch. We start right away with primary evidence number one, which by itself includes four different irrefutable exclusive markings. Exclusive markings in the sense that they could not possibly be pointing to anyone else other than Muhammad sallallahu This is ayah 54 and 55. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing Ismail. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَاعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّ وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيَّ So these two brief ayat explain to us four characteristics about Ismail. So the translation goes, and recall in the dhikr, in the message of the scripture, Ismail. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give us the descriptions of Ismail. And these descriptions, as you see, one, two, three, four, 
are perfect match for Muhammad. Four different markings, four perfect matches, exclusive to Muhammad in the Quran. And you're gonna see for yourself, and you're gonna say, Allahu Akbar, how did they miss this? I don't know how they missed it. You're gonna see for yourself. The first one, إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ He has been truthful in promise. وَكَانَ رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا And he has been a Rasul who is a Nabi. And we talked about the difference between Rasul and Nabi in prior segments. وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ And he has been commanding his cohorts to conform to Salat and Zakat. I know has been commanding is not exact the translation of كَانَ but we're going to see in detail that it is correct. وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مرضية. Again, the same كَانَ. We're going to see exactly why I chose this translation. He has been made content by his Lord. So four descriptions, we're going to see them one at a time. The first one, bullet number one, says he has been truthful in promise. كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa based on what the believers said at that time. وَلَمَّا رَأَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْزَابَ قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And when the believers saw with their own eyes the alliance of attackers against Medina, this is the story of the attack against Medina, which is referred to as Al-Ahzab, the alliance. They said, this is the believers, the believers said, this is what we were promised by Allah and his messenger. And Allah and his messenger are truthful and it increased them only in belief and submission. And this is a testimony by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah and his messenger are truthful. وَرَسُولُهُ This is the first link. Nowhere else in the Quran, any messenger, any messenger is described as truthful in this type of clear description. صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ So there was a promise, and the promise was given right here, promised by Allah and His Messenger, and Allah and His Messenger are truthful. This is the first link, this is the first marking. Again, exclusive to our beloved وسلم, in the Quran. You go check it out and tell me if you come up with any other messenger described exactly and clearly like this. The second one. وَكَانَ رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا He has been a Rasul who is a Nabi. Now, now we look also at Surah Al-Ahzab. This is bullet number two. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مَّنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Muhammad has not been sent as a forefather to any of you, but as a messenger from Allah and the seal of prophethood. Yes, I know, I said forefather. Those of you who are paying attention caught the hint, and we will talk more about this, inshallah, in the future. But as a messenger from Allah and the seal of prophethood. In other words, Muhammad was a Nabi and a messenger. He is described like that in other places we will see. But this is the second marking that clearly indicates that Muhammad وسلم, was this Rasul and Nabi. Now you're going to tell me, well, Musa was also described as Rasul and Nabi. And we're going to see why that does not fit in here. And this reference is exclusive to our beloved وسلم. The third marking is, وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ and he has been commanding his cohorts. Remember, Ahlahu does not mean only his family. This is evidence that the word Ahl is not just about family. Please get it through your head that Ahl is not about the direct family of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ahl were commanded to do Salat. And we're not talking about Salat in this segment. Please don't ask me about it. Don't write in the comment. We will deal with it in the future when we are ready. You are not ready to understand the concept of Salat right now. So please be patient and don't ask about it until we develop the concepts a little further and then we'll present it. The point is our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is described exactly the same way. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ Exactly the same wording. Beautiful. No other messenger, no other prophet in the Quran is given this specific link, this specific marking. And command your cohorts 
to conform to Salat. Again, we will discuss Salat in the future. And the last marking from these two ayat, وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيًّا He has been made content by his Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Surah Al-Duha, Surah 93, ayah number 5. وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى And certainly your Lord shall give you so that you are content. Well, Dr. Haney, this doesn't say he was content by his Lord. Well, this is a promise by Allah. And when Allah gives someone a promise, it's as good as fulfilled. وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ Allah shall give you, your Lord shall give you, so that you are content. So therefore, Muhammad Wasallam was مَرْضِيًّا This is a passive participle, مَرْضِيًّا Not مُرْضِيًّا, which is an active participle. It's in fa'il. مَرْضِيًّا is مَفْعُول He was made content by his Lord. So therefore, these four markings right here in this short paragraph from Surah Maryam, these two ayat, clearly indicate that Muhammad وسلم, is the best fit for the description of Ismail as given. I could stop the video right here and this should be enough for most of you. But we're going to continue because we're going to follow the methodology. We're not going to jump with joy at the first idea that occurs to us, even though there's clear evidence we're going to see more reinforcing evidence and we're going to knock off all the possible contradictions that may appear to be contradictions. And you're going to see they fit perfectly with this answer. Muhammad وسلم, was Ismail. I hope you're happy. I hope you're excited as I am because this discovery has been hidden from us for 1400 years. People purposefully hid it. Why? Because they had agendas. Because they wanted us to trust that there are other books. That this book is just like the others. We can take the stories from there. And we can follow their lead. And we can do the same mistakes that they did. This is the result of their mistakes. So I hope you are as excited as I am. Because we're going to see more beautiful evidence. We continue inshallah. Evidence number two. This is another primary evidence. This is a long paragraph from Surah Al-A'raf, so I hope you're patient because I want to go through it in full detail. I don't want to leave any stone unturned. I don't want to leave any evidence that we have not investigated. From Surah Al-A'raf, Surah 7, Ayah 156, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَاكْتُبْ لَنَا فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ إِنَّا هُدْنَا إِلَيْكَ قَالَ عَذَابِ أُصِيبُ بِهِ مَنْ أَشَاءُ وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فسأكتبها للذين يتقون ويؤتون الزكاة والذين هم بآياتنا يؤمنون. This is a part of a conversation between Musa and Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Musa is addressing Allah سبحانه وتعالى and making a dua. And you can read the paragraph before it and you can confirm exactly what I'm saying. So Musa said, Allah is addressing Allah and decree for us Musa, Harun and the 70 men Musa chose. This is the context. So I'm being faithful to the context. Insight in this life and decree for us in the style of Al-Akhirah, the delayed, diligent understanding. Wafil Akhirah. So give us insight in this dunya and in the style of Al-Akhirah. In other words, not the rushed interpretation. This is what Musa is making a dua for. By the way, if you want to learn a beautiful dua, this is a beautiful dua right there. So Pick it up from this ayah in Surah Al-A'raf, memorize it and start saying it. رَبَّنَا اكْتُبْ لَنَا فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ This is different than the other one, وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً This is different. This ayah is more insightful, more beautiful. So inshallah you will learn from this. So Musa continues, إِنَّا هُدْنَا إِلَيْكَ We have taken to you for guidance. He, Allah, said or replied, it is my punishment with which I target whomever I will. And my mercy is plentiful in everything in the scripture. كل شيء, remember, كل شيء, whenever we see كل شيء in relationship to scripture, it means everything in the scripture. Everything in the scripture. And thus, I shall decree it for those who practice discipline. للذين يتقون and bring forth zakat, and also to those who believe in our signs. 
you're going to look at this and say, this is present tense. This is present tense. So was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking only about people who are with Musa? We're going to see. Just hold your horses. You're going to see. Be patient. You're going to see why it is present tense. The next ayah explains exactly why it's present tense. الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّيِّ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَاهُمْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمْ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمْ الْخَبَائِثِ وَيَضَعُ عَنْهُمْ إِصْرَهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ So I'm going to stop here because this next part is separated. You will see why. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues talking to Musa. Remember, the conversation is in response to what Musa made a dua for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuing. And now we see this is present tense also. Allah continuing to address Musa in reply to Musa's supplication. So Allah says to Musa, remember this, this is really critical. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give hasana insight to those who are disciplined and who bring forth zakat and who believe in our signs and those who follow the messenger who is a prophet and ummi. We have a messenger, prophet, and now he added ummi. Ummi. Why? Because as we described in a prior segment, he is described as not a student of earlier scriptures. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa, when this messenger comes in the future, he will not know anything about the prior scriptures. So this messenger and Nabi al-Ummi, this messenger who is a prophet and Ummi, they shall find foretold in what they shall have of the Torah and the Injil. Wait, what are you talking about? Remember, Allah is talking to Musa about a future messenger. So he's saying to them that they will find in what they shall have of the Torah and the Injil, the true Torah and Injil, not the one that's corrupted at the time of revelation of this ayah. So this ayah has a present tense, not because it's describing that the Torah and Injil were correct at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. This ayah is a continuation of the speech between Allah and Musa, telling Musa about future events. So at that time, the Torah has not been fully revealed. The Injil has not been even revealed yet. But Allah is telling Musa, you shall have the Torah. You shall have the Injil. And this messenger who's also a Nabi and a prophet should be mentioned there. So pay attention to the future references that you will receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is not evidence that the Torah and Injil at the time of revealing this ayah were correct. On the opposite, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling Musa, you shall have a mention of this Rasul, Nabi, Ummi, when I reveal to you the full Torah and Injil. And then he continues the description. يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَاهُمْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمْ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمْ الْخَبَائِثِ وَيَضَعُوا عَنْهُمْ إِصْرَهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, He, meaning this messenger, He shall command them towards what is known and shall declare as forbidden to them what is abominable, what is munkar, and shall make lawful for them the satisfying things and shall prohibit for them the impure things and shall relieve them of their burdensome obligations and the mental constraints imposed upon them. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa, you're going to have some burdensome requirements placed on you, which happened. 613 requirements in the Sharia of Musa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them in advance, when this messenger come, he will relieve you of some of these burdensome requirements. He will also remove some of the mental shackles that you will have until then. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning them, you're going to stay in that state and you're going to have these problems until this Rasul Nabi Ummi comes. Guess who that Rasul Nabi Ummi is? Of course, it's our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, this ayah continues and now notice, this is the first part of the speech 
by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa. This second part is another part of the same ayah, but a different switch, a different speech. So how do we know? We know because this verb you're going to see is past tense. فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِهِ وَعَزَّرُوهُ Past tense. وَنَصَرُوهُ Past tense. وَاتَّبَعُوا النُّورَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ مَعَهُ Past tense. أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is giving us a conclusion. Fast forward to the time when this ayah was revealed. At the time of this ayah was revealed, those who believed in him, meaning in this messenger, honored him, supported him, and followed him all in the past. So it cannot possibly be part of the same speech given to Musa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala split two parts of the same ayah into two different pieces of information. The first part of the ayah is a continuation of the prior promise to Musa. And the second part of the same ayah is giving us the conclusion. In other words, Allah had warned them since the time of Musa that there is a Rasul, Nabi, Ummi coming. We all know that would be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but we're going to see more evidence. And since then, they knew that there would be such a prophet coming and therefore they had the obligation. And thus, anyone who believed in him, honored him, supported him, and followed the illumination that has been made accessible to him, those are the prosperers. فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ This is Ayah 157. We continue with the same paragraph. Please remain patient because this is going to be brought to a beautiful conclusion that is really essential as part of the primary evidence number two. So the same paragraph continues. قُلْ This is addressing our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا O people, I am the messenger from Allah to you all. الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض لا إله إلا هو يحيي ويميت فآمنوا بالله ورسوله النبي الأمي الذي يؤمن بالله وكلماته واتبعوه لعلكم تهتدون Therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them Say O Muhammad, O mankind or O people I am the messenger from Allah to you all يا أيها الناس إني رسول الله إليكم جميعا To all mankind to all people, Jami'an confirms it's not just a partial group of Anas, all of you. From he to whom belongs the sovereign dominance over the layers of understanding and the scripture. There is no deity except him. He revives and causes death and thus believe in Allah and in the messenger who is a prophet and ummi. Of course, he's talking about himself. Remember this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to speak about himself in the third person. Let me repeat it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching our beloved to speak about himself in the third person. So when we talked about Dhul Qarnayn, who is also, as you know, speaking about himself in the third person, قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُ From him. Dhikran, he's talking about himself in the third person. This is exactly the same ayah. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ His messenger. Well, who is that messenger he's talking about? He's talking about himself. Why is this important? As we continue, the question then becomes, when Allah promised that there shall be a Rasul and a Bi, using this marking as we saw it from the first ayah in this paragraph from Surah Al-A'raf, who was he talking about? He was talking about Muhammad, clearly. Now, we go back to this ayah, Ismail, Ismail is described in Surah Maryam. Please pay attention. This is really critical, but it's subtle. And you have to really be alert to really get it. So there are two people that at the time of Musa could have been promised to be written about in future scriptures. One of them is the Torah, one of them is the Injil. Could it be one of the two people mentioned in the Quran as Rasul Nabi? Only these two ayat from Surah Maryam, 51 and 54. The first one described Musa as Rasul Nabi. The second one described Ismail as Rasul Nabi. So in the promise that we just saw in here, الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيُّ الْأُمِّيِّ Which was given to Musa 
Is it possible that it's talking about Musa himself? No, of course, because Musa was already receiving the Torah when this came to him. So therefore, it is definitely talking about our beloved Rasul and Nabi. So it is discussing Muhammad, but yet Ismail is the other person described as Rasul Nabi. So it cannot possibly be Musa. So this is a second evidence that Ismail was himself our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasul and Nabi. Now, as I promised, we come back to the verb kana, wa kana, innahu kana, kana. So kana is a past tense verb. It seems to be saying he was, as if it's talking about someone in the past. But it's not true. The Quran is full of the use of the verb kana, and it is referring to has been or continues to be. So there are 42 such occurrences, and these are a couple of examples. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا Allah has been the source of evidence-based knowledge, the source of linguistic discernment, Hakim. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been the one who grants to reconnect with him and the merciful one. So in summary, this paragraph from Surah Al-A'raf, which started with a supplication from Musa and was followed by a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, referred to Al-Rasul, Al-Nabi, Al-Ummi. It is definitely pointing to Ismail, and Ismail could not have been before Musa because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that this shall be written in the Torah and the Injil, which was yet to come at the time of Musa. So if it was talking about Ismail, who is the son of Ibrahim, as they told us, Musa would have known this. And the writing about this Rasul Nabi would not have been in this style. So therefore, when we read about this ayah, وَاذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَاعِيلِ إِنَّهُ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا It is only possibly pointing to Muhammad, our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I hope this is clear. This was the second primary evidence that we present in this segment. Now we move to the third primary evidence. The third primary evidence relates to the same paragraph we saw before, Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 129. We said that we're not going to touch Al-Qawaida Min Al-Bayt and we will deal with it in the future. We talked briefly about it and we said there is a split of Ibrahim and Ismail who are the two subjects of this verb yarfa'u. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala split them apart because they happened in different points in time. Now we're going to give a different evidence, a different way to understand this ayat so that we can extract more bayinat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ And when Ibrahim raised Al-Qawaida مِنَ الْبَيْتِ and Ismail too, not along with him, not with him, and Ismail too. And then there is a sudden supplication that comes in here. And we don't know who said it. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا Yes, it is in the plural sense, but you're going to see it is not what we think. رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا Our Lord accept from us. You are indeed As-Sami'a, the one who provides the hearing, and Al-Alim, the one who provides the evidence-based knowledge. Rabbana waj'alna muslimayni lak. Our Lord, remind us, both of us, now whoever is making this supplication, is making a supplication for two people. Muslimayni lak. Notice this is not saying Ibrahim is making that dua. Pay attention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not telling us who made this dua. So it's possible that both of them are making the same dua at different times. The Quran is not telling us Ibrahim said this. It's not telling us that Ismail said this. It's not telling us that they both said it together. So it is possible that each one of them is making a similar dua, but at different times. رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكْ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا And from our progeny, from our descendants, أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكْ A community that submits to you. وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ I leave it for you to find the translation for these parts. And then we continue from Ayah 129. 
ربنا وابعث فيهم رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياتك ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة ويزكيهم إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم Our Lord send among them Who is them in this case? Because in the prior ayah it is talking about two people So who is them? Them in here not فيهما Not in both of them But فيهم in the sense of plural Community of plural So it's definitely referring to ذريتنا This tells us that the same dhurriya of Ibrahim is the same dhurriya of Ismail. This is very clear from this ayat. So the dua in here, Rabbana wabath fihim rasulan minhum, meaning from dhurriyatina. In other words, if we claim that Muhammad is Ismail and dhurriya of Ibrahim and dhurriya of Ismail, they must be the same, one and the same. In other words, the same lineage. So Ismail is from the descendants of Ibrahim. This is confirming it. And they're not together at the time of making this dua. وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ So here's the question. Who is this Rasul? He is given a clear description. Watch the description and you will guess exactly who that person is. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ He recites your signs or your ayat وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّهِمْ And he provides them the knowledge. He teaches them the message of the scripture and al-hikmah. If you remember, al-hikmah is al-bayinat. فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ عِيسَى بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ قَالَ قَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِالْحِكْمَةِ When Isa brought them Al-Bayinat, the ways to extract evidence from the scripture, he told them, I brought you hikmah. So hikmah equal the bayinat, the collection of evidence extracting instruments. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And then he purifies them. So these four attributes, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Four different things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to describe this person. Who is this person? This person is Rasul from Zurriya of Ibrahim. He is Rasul from the descendants of Ibrahim. So the Riyatina, Ibrahim and Ismail are the same Zurriya. So therefore it is applicable to Ibrahim. Therefore it must be from the Riyya of Ibrahim. I hope this makes sense. This is basic logic, basic mathematical reasoning. So therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that whoever made this dua, Rabbana, is talking about fi him, meaning the dhurriya. So it must be Ibrahim who's making this dua. It cannot be Ismail, because Ismail came later by all accounts. So therefore, yatlu alayhim ayatika wa yu'allimuhum al-kitaba wal-hikmah wa yizakkihim is matched in three ayat describing our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yatlu alayhim ayatina wa yizakkikum wa yu'allimuhum al-kitaba wal-hikmah almost word for word in three different ayat. So therefore, Muhammad was described as the fulfillment of this supplication. Pay attention. Muhammad is described clearly as the fulfillment of this supplication. Supplication by whom? By Ibrahim. Well, if Ibrahim and Ismail were together, it cannot possibly be Ismail that Ibrahim is referring to. Because Ismail was with him. Either that or Ibrahim did not have a clue that Ismail, his own son supposedly, would grow up to be a messenger. Which is impossible because Ibrahim had that knowledge, must have had that knowledge. So therefore the ayah is talking about a single messenger to come later from the descendants of Ibrahim. From the descendants of Ibrahim. That messenger is clearly matched by these three ayat which give a perfect match to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So remember, Ibrahim was a Nabi, not a Rasul. So he himself was not that messenger. So if Ibrahim was making a dua for a future messenger, a single future messenger, from the descendants he left there in Mecca, as we said, among the descendants, that means that Ismail was not with him. That's very clear. Primary evidence number four is about separating two subjects of one verb. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separated Ismail from Ibrahim, proving 
that Ismail was not with Ibrahim as it appears from this ayah and as some people claim they were together. No, they were not together. And we explained this before when we talked about the first part of this segment. So now we move to the secondary evidence that Ismail was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, present versus past tense. Again, I need you to pay attention because this is really relevant. So in the same paragraph again from Surah Al-Baqarah, which starts with Ayah 124 and ends with Ayah 129, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is using وَإِذْ followed by a verb. وَإِذْ followed by a verb in the past tense. Here, وَإِذْ followed by a verb in the past tense. Here, وَإِذْ followed by a verb in the past tense. This is all related to Ibrahim in the past. In this ayah right here, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنًا وَاتَّخِذُ مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُصَلَّى وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ And we will talk more about this in just a few minutes. Just be patient. So then suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts using the present tense. I explained how the present tense when it applies to two different people, then the last one must at least be still doing that act. So if I have two people who came to eat in my house at different times and I want to describe them as eating. If one of them came yesterday and the second one came today, so I say both of these brothers came to my house and they're eating. It doesn't mean both are still eating today. One of them could have eaten yesterday, for example, but the second one is still eating today. So I describe them, they're eating. This is a way to concatenate the two sentences. I hope this makes sense. So now we notice that this is past, this is past, and this is past tense, but this one is present tense. So it's talking about someone, at least part of that group of subjects, currently in the present tense when the ayah was revealed. So we come to this analysis, which is really interesting. Again, it's secondary evidence, it's not primary, but it's really interesting to pay attention to such things in the Quran. There are many, many instances of wa'idh, and whenever it is followed by a present tense, it is applicable to Muhammad and or his community at the time. Let me repeat it. After wa'idh, whenever we have a present tense verb, it is constantly referring to either Muhammad or Muhammad and his community. Except in two cases, in two instances, one of them is clearly talking about arguing, group of people arguing finnar in the fire, and we describe the fire present tense in the sense that it is present and future. And in another instance in Surah 110 of Surah Al-Ma'idah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing Isa ibn Maryam, and then he's talking to him in the present tense. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to someone, he talks to him, in the present tense. وَإِذْ تَخْلُقُ creates in the present tense. So therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a present tense after وَإِذْ when it's applicable to the time of revelation and the future. That means وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ applies at the time of revelation and in the future. So that means Ismail must have been present at the time of revelation of this ayah. Ismail cannot possibly be the direct son of Ibrahim. And that matches the conclusion that we have reached, which is our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is himself Ismail. Secondary evidence number two. Why was Muhammad not mentioned in the list of prophets in the following ayat from Surah Al-An'am? Again, this is a long paragraph, but please learn from this so we can build on these concepts for future segments. وزكريا ويحيى وعيسى وإلياس كل من الصالحين وإسماعيل واليسع ويونس ولوطا وكلا فضلنا على العالمين. So clearly in this list Muhammad is not mentioned at least by specific name and we're gonna see this is really relevant to confirm 
that Ismail was himself Muhammad. I just want to put it in front of you for now. We're going to deal with it again when we verify some of the evidences and some of the conclusions that we have reached. And the translation is right there in front of the screen. If you want to read it, pause the video and you can do this, inshallah. And with this, we move to verifying the conclusions that we have reached. Verification requires us to look at all the other observations and make sure there is no contradiction. There is nothing in the other observations in the Quran that tell us our conclusions could be wrong. So in other words, we don't fall in love with the theory or with the conjecture that we built, but we make sure it is applicable to all observations, not just part of the observations. So the first one is, what about the fact that Ibrahim used Rabbana in the plural in Ayah 127 and 128? وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ رَبَّنَا رَبَّنَا Supposedly this is a dua by Ismail or by Ibrahim. But in this case, he said, our Lord. In other words, they were plural. Well, رَبَّنَا in here, also plural. رَبَّنَا in here, also plural. Is that true? Can we say that whenever we see رَبَّنَا, that means multiple people are speaking. So in other words, if this complaint or this objection is valid, we should not find any instance in the Quran where people are using Rabbana, but yet the speaker is a single person. Let's see if this is true. Well, we look at Surah Yunus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, وَقَالَ مُوسَى رَبَّنَا Musa said, our Lord, our Lord, Rabbana, plural. He's making a dua by himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us, Musa is saying this, Rabbana, our Lord. So he's talking about the Lord of multiple people. But the person who is speaking is one person. In other words, Rabbana in here, and Rabbana in here, Wa'arina, which is also plural, in here, Wa'tub'alayna, which is also plural, could be coming from a single speaker, from a person speaking by himself. So that could be Ibrahim by himself. I hope this makes sense because we're going to follow through and give more evidence to the same thing. So in Ayah 42.15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, He's addressing Muhammad وسلم, by himself. And make sure you're upright as you were commanded. He's talking to a singular addressee and do not follow their whims. وَقُلْ آمَنْتُ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ Say, I believe in what Allah has made accessible. مِنْ كِتَابٍ Of the message. وَأُمِرْتُ لِأَعْدِلَ بَيْنَكُمْ And I've been commanded to provide equity among you. اللَّهُ رَبُّنَا وَرَبُّكُمْ Allah is our Lord and your Lord. So Prophet ﷺ was commanded to make that statement using رَبُّنَا The plural Lord. Not Rabbi. He could have said Rabbi wa Rabbukum. And that would have been fine. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him to use Rabbuna. Even though, even though the ayah is teaching Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alone what to say. So therefore a single person can use the word Rabbuna. Without indicating that there are multiple people with him. Another example from Surah 60, Ayah 4 and 5. إِلَّا قَوْلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ لَأَسْتَغْفِرَنَّ لَكَ وَمَا أَمْلِكُ لَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ رَبَّنَا عَلَيْكَ تَوَكَّلْنَا Our Lord upon you we rely. This is clearly Ibrahim by himself saying this to his father. His father was a rejecter. He associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore it is not Ibrahim saying my Lord and the Lord and my father and we're making a dua together. No, this is Alone, Ibrahim speaking, Qawla Ibrahim by himself, and he's saying, Rabbana, our Lord. So therefore, a single person can be addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying, Rabbana. One more evidence, inshallah, in here from Surah 14, Ayah 36 to 41. The speaker here is Ibrahim. Ibrahim by himself is speaking. Clearly, this is the ayah, you can check the context for yourself. And there are several ayat in here from 36 
to 41, five different ayat. The first one, Rabbi, my Lord. The next one, Rabbana, our Lord. The next one, Askantu min dhurriyati, from my descendants and progeny, they have taken residence in this valley, Askantu min dhurriyati, speaking in the, in the singular form. And then he continues, Rabbana, our Lord. And then he switches back, Rabbi, my Lord. And then he switches back one more time, Rabbana, our Lord. So this is the same single person speaking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is recounting to us everything that Ibrahim said. And one time he uses Rabbi, one time he uses Rabbana, but all along one person speaking. So in other words, when we see Rabbana in this paragraph and Rabbana in this paragraph, it does not mean that there are multiple people together speaking. Again, the exercise we're doing is applying the verification part of the methodology. We're making sure that there are no observations that contradict, that refute our conclusions or our theory that we have put forth, which is Ismail is none other than our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We continue with the second verification. Why speak about Ismail in the third person? In this ayah, ayah 136 of Surah Al-Baqarah, قُولُوا آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ وَالْأَصْبَاطِ Say, we believe in Allah, in what has been made accessible for us, and what has been made accessible to Ibrahim and Ismail. Has been made accessible, past tense, and Ismail, third person reference. How come? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching us to say all of these things, past tense and third person reference? Okay, for us we understand. What about the people who were reading this ayah at the time of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? As I showed you before, Muhammad was given the opportunity to speak about himself in the third person. So here, even if Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reading this ayah, it's perfectly fine. He's talking about himself, Ismail, in the past tense. He's also talking about himself, Ismail, in the third person. But of course, this is the style of the Quran that I've just demonstrated one time in this segment and one time in the series about Dhul Qarnayn. So therefore, there is no problem with the believers saying that. Therefore, this ayah is not evidence that Ismail came before Muhammad. So here, this is another evidence. أَمْ تَقُولُونَ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ الْأَصْبَاطِ كَانُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا There's a past tense in here. And the claim is some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the non-believers. Or do you claim, indeed, Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and the Asbat, we leave it as it is, were Jews or Christians. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quoting them. Pay attention. Inna, in green in here, indicates that this is their quotation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not speaking for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us quotation marks, what they said exactly. And they said, Inna Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq wa Yaqub wa Asbat, Kanu, they were Christian or Jews. Of course, that's what they claim. They claim that Ismail is past tense to them at the time of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this ayah is addressing them. Do you say, quote, Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and Asbat were Jews or Christians? Of course, that's what they say. This is not a confirmation by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala that Ismail is past tense. This is what they say, what they claim. I hope this makes sense. So again, this quotation mark indicates that they made that claim, but it is not true. Therefore, this ayah is not evidence that Ismail came before. I hope you're paying attention to the amount of detail that we're putting into this research so that we don't leave anything unchecked. We don't leave any possibility for confusion or for possibility that this theory, Ismail equal Muhammad, is wrong. Verification number three. Ismail is one of Yaqub's forefathers. Listen to this ayah. أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَاءَ إِذْ حَضَرَ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتُ إِذْ قَالَ لِبَنِيهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي قَالُوا نَعْبُدُ إِلَهَكَ وَإِلَهَ آبَائِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ Right there, آبَائِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ 
إلها واحدا ونحن له مسلمون. Let's translate it patiently, especially my Arabic speaking brothers. Be patient and listen and learn and allow the Quran to teach us because it is not what you think. So let's read it carefully and analyze it. Or were you present when death presented itself to Yaqub? In other words, it was time for him to die. It was on his deathbed, so to speak. And he was giving a reminder or preaching to his children and descendants. When he said to his children, Bani, remember Bani can possibly take another meaning and we will see it later, inshallah. What will you worship after me? They said, we worship your God, Ilahaka, and the God of your forefathers. Aha, forefathers, that means Ismail came before. No, 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 just wait, just wait. Ibrahim, wa Ismail, and Ishaq. Three forefathers mentioned in here. Did they all really come before Yaqub? We're going to see. Just be patient. You're going to be amazed by this one. Just be patient. A single God and to whom we are submitters. وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ So let's analyze it. The first part is that the expression مِنْ بَعْدِي مِنْ بَعْدِي After me is not restricted to the lifetime of his children. Of course he's addressing them. But he's addressing all of those who will be taught by them. Remember the concept of the forefathers is the teachers, the people who came before, or as we will see, refer to something else. We're going to see, just be patient. The second part, Aba'ika, your forefathers, does not indicate those who came before you. Why do I say this? Because in Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us how the Quran uses the Arabic references, the Arabic pronouns. So in Ayah 41 of Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ أَنَّا حَمَلْنَا ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ فِي الْفُلْكِ الْمَشْحُونَ Those who are Arabic speakers, please ponder this a little bit and think. This Hamalna is past tense. This ذُرِّيَّة is future generations. So how could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be talking about future generation in the past tense? So the translation is, and a sign was given to them, to the unbelievers, this is the context, that we carried, past tense, their progeny, future, on the loaded fulk, fil fulk. We're not going to talk about al-fulk, we'll talk about it when we talk about the story of Nuh, inshallah. So for now, I'll put it aside, please accept that. But we focus on the issue at hand. Carried, past tense, progeny is future. Dhurriya, your descendants. Some of them are not born yet. So how could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be talking about future progeny in the past tense? Because dhurriyatahum, you see this hum in here, which is a third person pronoun for the plural. It does not mean their progeny. It means a progeny of their type. In other words, a similar dhurriya. A dhurriya that matches the description of themselves. That means a dhurriya from the same descendants. So dhurriya from the same descendants were carried with Nuh in the fulk. That dhurriya which belongs to them, which is attached to them. This is like the example I gave before. Like a teacher taking his class, his own class students up to class. And he says, I am taking my kids up to class. Well, they're not his kids. They're the kids that belong to his class. They're the kids associated with him. They're not literally his descendants, his own biological children. Same thing. Dhurriyatahum, it doesn't mean their biological descendants. It means the dhurriya of the same type as theirs. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Musa and says, فَمَا آمَنَ لَهُ إِلَّا ذُرِّيَّةٌ مِنْ قَوْمِهِ عَلَىٰ خَوْفٍ مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَمَلَئِهِ Only a dhurriya, a group of descendants, believed for him, for Musa. So the group of descendants, it didn't say descendants of whom. So this is a reference to a group of people who came from the same descendancy. So the same concept applies to forefather. Aba doesn't mean previous forefathers. Aba means the teachers who are like you. And the concept in here 
is referring to Yaqub. So it is matching Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq that they are forefathers just like Yaqub. So they are Aba'ika, that means forefathers of the same monotheistic faith, of the same monotheistic tradition, of the same Abrahamic locution that you're using. So therefore, Aba'ika, your forefathers, doesn't mean they came before you. It indicates those who are like you, a forefather to those who come after them. So therefore, Ismail could have very well come after Yaqub. Aba does not mean biological fathers. Aba means teachers, forefathers to others who come after them. That's all it means. Just like Dhurriya means they come from a similar progeny. I hope this makes sense. So there is no evidence in this ayah that Ismail came before Yaqub. Now we go to the verification item number four. Allah granted Ismail and Ishaq to Ibrahim. And this is commonly referred to by those who claim that Ismail was a direct descendant or a direct son of Ibrahim. Ibrahim is quoted as saying, Alhamdulillah alladhi wahaba li ala al-kibari Ismail wa Ishaq inna rabbi la sami'u dua Praise be to Allah who granted me Ismail and Ishaq Despite my old age, indeed my Lord responds to supplication. The verb that's used is wahaba, and they say, aha, uh -huh, wahaba, he granted me, he gave me Ismail and Ishaq. Wait, wait, wait. Grant is used in the Quran in many different ways. Some of them have nothing to do with children. For example, Musa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him by saying, wa wahabna lahu min rahmatina akhahu haruna nabiyya. We granted him from our mercy, his brother Harun as a prophet. Therefore, the brother is not a gift, a grant of children. Second one, وَامْرَأَةً مُؤْمِنَةً إِنْ وَهَبَتْ نَفْسَهَا لِلنَّبِي And a free believing woman who grants herself to the prophet. Granting in this case, the verb وَهَبَ is used, obviously has nothing to do with children. And in the case of Ayyub in Surah Sad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ And we granted him Ahlahu, his cohorts, and people like them with them. So therefore, it has nothing to do with direct descendants. He's not talking about children. So, وَهَبَ لِي عَلَى الْكِبَرِ It does not necessitate that Ismail is his own child. So therefore, this ayah is not evidence that Ismail came during Ibrahim's life. As you see, all of these objections, we're knocking them off and we're making sure that nothing is left unexplained. This ayah is a major obstacle to the theory that we presented. But as you see from the evidence from the Quran, it's very clear to explain it and understand it in a way that is consistent with the theory or with the conjecture that we propose, which is Ismail equal Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And now we move to item number five, verifying our conclusion. Again, as you see, methodically taking every possible objection and knocking it off and making sure that it is explainable in a way that is consistent with the theory. And therefore now all of the ayat make sense. By the way, in the process, we're going to discover some amazing things. You'll just see. So item number five says, Muhammad was ordered to purify the bait with Ibrahim. Well, we saw already with this wa, with does not mean they were together. So the same command was given to Ibrahim, was given later to Muhammad or to Ismail. That fits perfectly in this ayah. Ibrahim wa Ismail an wal wal sujud. And we assigned an oath to Ibrahim and Ismail that you shall purify my bait. Again, we're going to leave bait. We're not going to discuss it in this segment. Just be patient. We will come back to it at a future time, inshallah. For the circumambulating those who remain in worship and those who are on their knees in prostration. Does this apply to indicate that they were together? Of course not. The same exact oath was given to Ibrahim and was given later to Ismail, meaning Muhammad. This ayah applies to both people. Is there concealment in the Quran? Absolutely. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requiring us to do some really hard digging to extract the truth? Of course. Was this hidden from us 
and it could have been a lot easier absolutely absolutely you will see it for yourself i'm going to show you evidence that there was some hiding that was done by people who wrote some narrations just be patient i promise you some beautiful gifts at the end of the segment those of you who are patient who stay with me all the way to the end of this segment inshallah will learn some amazing things now we go to the item number six on our verification list Muhammad was ordered to follow the guidance of Ismail. Ah, how do you get out of this one, Dr. Rehani? So this is from a paragraph from Surah Al-An'am. We're going to see it. It's, it's actually two paragraphs. It starts here and continues on the next page. So inshallah, you will be patient. وَتِلْكَ حُجَّتُنَا آتَيْنَاهَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِ نَرْفَعُ دَرَجَاتٍ مَّنْ نَشَاءُ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ حَكِيمٌ عَلِيمٌ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبُ كُلًّا هَدَيْنَا وَنُوحًا هَدَيْنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ وَأَيُّوبَ وَيُوسُفَ وَمُوسَى وَهَارُونَ وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِي الْمُحْسِنِينَ وَزَكَرِيَّا وَيَحْيَى وَعِيسَى وَإِلْيَاسَ كُلٌّ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ وَإِسْمَاعِيلَ وَالْيَسَعَ وَيُونُسَ وَلُوطًا وَكُلًّا فَضَّلْنَا عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ وَمِنْ آبَائِهِمْ وَذُرِّيَّاتِهِمْ وَإِخْوَانِهِمْ وَاجْتَبَيْنَاهُمْ وَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ so the translation goes like this and this was our argument which we allowed Ibrahim to learn we taught Ibrahim that argument it's talking clearly about a context that is mentioned in Surah Al-An'am earlier to use against his community ala qawmihi why because his community were all associating with Allah they were worshiping idols etc etc we exalt in degrees whom we choose narfa'u darajatin من نشاء by the way نرفع يرفع نرفع وإذ يرفع إبراهيم remember this there is a connection between this in the same context of the same story the same Abrahamic locution Allah سبحانه وتعالى is teaching us نرفع درجات we exalt in degrees whom we choose therefore it's not necessarily physical raising physical lifting it is possibly a metaphorical lifting as is clearly used with the verb رفعه right here in this ayah we exalt in degrees whom we choose indeed your lord is a source of discernment provider of evidence-based knowledge and we granted him ishaq count with me so first we have ibrahim and then we granted him ishaq and yaqub both of them we guided and nuh we had guided before clearly telling us that Nuh came before Ibrahim and of his progeny Dawood meaning the progeny of Ibrahim Sulaiman, Ayyub, Yusuf, Musa, Harun and thus do we recompense the insightful and Zakaria and Yahya and Isa and Ilyas every one of them among those who toil on the scripture in accordance with the divine lexicon and Ismail Ilyasa'a, Yunus, and Lut, every one of them we favored over all the realms of people, the groups of people, and of their forefathers, their progeny, and their brethren, we made them such that their supplications are dignified, and we guided them to a methodology for self-correction, siratin mustaqim. So now we continue with the paragraph. ذَلِكَ هُدَى اللَّهِ يَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ ولو أشركوا لحبط عنهم ما كانوا يعملون أولئك الذين آتيناهم الكتاب والحكم والنبوة فإن يكفر بها هؤلاء فقد وكلنا بها قوما ليسوا بها بكافرين أولئك الذين هدى الله فبهداهم اقتده قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إن هو إلا ذكرى للعالمين This is the key point that I promise you is going to be amazing and phenomenal if you pay attention and pay attention to the nuances of what it will teach us about the Quran. So we translate this paragraph now. That is the guidance of Allah. ذَلِكَ هُدَى Allah. He guides with it whoever chooses among his wayfarers. Notice I didn't say whomever. I said whoever chooses. Meaning if you choose, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you. Choose but you fulfill the conditions. Choose without associating with Allah. Choose without shirk. Ask for maghfirah, for reconnection with Allah. If you make all of these conditions fulfilled as Allah specified them in the Quran, you're making the right choice. Allah promised. 
Allah promised that he will guide you. And had they associated others with Allah, their toiling on the scripture would have distracted them. وَلَوْ أَشْرَكُوا Meaning all of these prophets that we discussed, لَحَبِطَ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Those prophets and messengers mentioned earlier are the ones to whom we have provided the message of the scripture, the linguistic discernment, and the ways of prophethood. There is a wealth of treasures in these ayat. And if these, meaning the non-believers at the time of Muhammad, Ha'ula is generally referring to people who rejected Muhammad وسلم, and generally among the Ba'udah. So Ha'ula is a code word used throughout the Quran in general. Sometimes it doesn't apply, but in general, it is referring to the same group, the Ba'uda, as we described. So if these, al Ba'uda, reject them, meaning these kitab, wal hukum, wal nubuwa, the message of the scripture, the linguistic discernment, and the ways of prophethood, if they reject them, well then we have assigned them the same thing to a community who are not rejectors of them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising to make the transfer, the shift, as we saw, inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. There is a new caretaker of what? Of al-ard, the scripture, not earth. This is exactly what this ayah is talking about. Those prophets and messengers mentioned earlier are the ones who have been guided and thus iqtadih. This is the word that we're going to focus on. So I need you to stay awake and really pay attention because I'm going to detail it and analyze it to death. So you're going to be left with awe because it is such an amazing word and you're going to see for yourself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and thus iqtadih using the guidance provided to them. Bihudahum in their guidance or the guidance referring to their guidance given by Allah to them. Iqtadih. We're going to see what it means. Say, I do not ask you for recompense for it. It is but a dhikra to all the realms. We talked about dhikra again in the series of Surah Abasa, uh, part number two and part number three, if I recall. Please go back to that series. We discussed it many times in many segments since that time. So, iqtadih, how was it translated or how was it interpreted? In general, there is a complete agreement among the tafsir books and among the interpreters and the translators of the Quran what it means to them. And you're going to see that's wrong. So I'm going to share with you exactly what they said and I'm going to give you the evidence that what they said does not make sense. It does not fit with their own translation of similar examples in the Quran. So let me clarify. I'm going to first give you their interpretation and I'm going to give you an interpretation of a very similar word and show you the conflict between their own translations and interpretations. So I hope this makes sense. Why? Because we need to get to the new translation or the new interpretation of this critical word and you're going to see how critical it is. Remember, the challenge is how could Muhammad وسلم, be instructed to follow the guidance given to several prophets and messengers, including Ismail. Does that hold water to the conjecture that we have, to the theory that Ismail equal Muhammad? We're going to see. So, Sahih International says, اقتدح means, so from their guidance, take an example. Pikthal says, so follow their guidance. Yusuf Ali, copy the guidance they received. Really bad translation. This is definitely wrong. Does not mean that at all. Shakir, therefore follow their guidance. Arbery, so follow their guidance. So in other words, اقتدح, اقتدح, this word, this word, اقتدح, they translated it and all the books of tafsir agree. Follow their guidance. Follow the guidance given to them. Remember, their guidance doesn't mean they brought it. Their guidance, they were given that guidance. So what does اقتدح really mean? What can we learn from the Quran regarding the word اقتدح? First, I want you to notice that there is a little ha at the very end. This little ha, which is a third person pronoun with a sukun over it. Why do I say it's a third person pronoun? 
because it's used in the Quran that way in three other cases. And the interpreters, the books of tafsir, and the translators totally missed them. They did not pay attention to those other cases exactly using the same letter with the same sukun, with the same diacritical mark of a silent H. <laughs> Without ha or he or who. It's a silent H. They did not pay attention to them. So learning from the Quran, there are three other examples with the suffix ha, which is the pronoun for it or him, with a sukun on top. This is not extraneous. They claimed that this ha in the verb iqtadih is extraneous just for pronunciation. It's not true. You're going to see it for yourself. I know this is detailed and I know this is digging so much in the Quran, but this is how we learn from the Quran. This is the beauty of the Quran. We don't have to guess. We have to look for similar examples and allow the Quran to teach us what we need to understand by iqtadih. So where do we see the same thing? A verb with the pronoun H with a sukun on top of it. The first ayah is ayah 111 from Surah Al-A'raf. Some of my Arab brothers are going to say, where do you get this stuff? It's in the Quran, Habibi. It's in the Quran. Just read with open eyes. Allah will teach you. Connect with Allah. Allah will open up the gifts and the treasures. We don't need to guess. We don't need to follow this person's opinion or that person's opinion. So the same translators, the same interpreters, here's how they dealt with the verb arjih. They said arjih, this is a group of advisors to Pharaoh who were telling Pharaoh about Musa and his brother. Arjih, postpone the matter of him. Arjih, a singular, third person. Arjih, talking about Musa and his brother. So therefore, this little ha is him. Third person, masculine, absent. Very clear. Is it one person who did this? No. All the books of tafsir understood it this way. All the translators understood it this way. Pikthal, him and his brother. Yusuf Ali, him and his brother. Shakir, him and his brother. Muhsin Khan, him and his brother. Arbery, him and his brother. Very clear. So this little ha is a third person pronoun. Look, it has the same skun over it. Just like iqtadih. Iqtadih. So therefore, here, here in these translations, they totally skipped over it. There is no third person pronoun. There's no third person pronoun. Look at the translations for yourself. They say, you Muhammad, conduct yourself or follow their guidance. Well, where is the ha, which is part of iqtadih? I hope this makes sense. I hope my question makes sense because you're going to see another example. So a second example is from Surah Shu'ara, almost exactly the same text, except with one difference of verb ibath instead of ersil, but the same arjih, the verb arjih is translated by all the translators and interpreted by all the mufassirun exactly the same way. This little ha in green, dark green in here is a third person pronoun, relative pronoun attached to the verb arjih. So the third example from Surat An-Naml, this is Sulaiman telling the hudhud. Remember the hudhud we said is not a bird, we're going to leave it. We'll discuss it in the future. He's telling the hudhud, take my letter, my message, and throw it to them. Take this letter of mine and deliver it to them. Deliver it. It. This is the ha right here. My Arabic speaking brothers know this. And they're probably wondering, how did the Mufassirun miss this? There is no excuse, to be honest with you, there is no excuse. Anybody who memorizes parts of the Quran must have memorized at least some of these ayat and must have wondered why there is a ha with a skun. Usually, فَأَلْقِهِ, there is a kasra on it. Usually, that's how we say it. إِلَيْهِ, that's how we say it. Why is there a skun? Because Allah is teaching you. Here in this example, in this case, it's an imperative verb, throw that letter, deliver that letter, deliver it. It is this little ha in here. Him is this little ha in here, as we saw in this example right here. 
So we look at all of the translations, deliver it, deliver it or throw it down, deliver it, hand it over, etc., etc. So they all agree that this little ha with a sukun includes a third person pronoun, even though the verb is an imperative verb. That means it's addressing the addressee and giving him a command. Alqih, throw it, deliver it, hand it over, etc. Arjih, put him off, delay him, give him some time uh, to wait, etc. So this is a command, imperative. Same thing in here, in this verb, iqtadih, that is imperative, and it's followed by the little ha with the sukun. So how come all the mufassirun and all the interpreters dismiss this? The answer is, iqtadih is actually not based on traditional Arabic grammar. This is not Arabic. This is Quranic, Habibi. This is Quran. Quran is not bound by the rules and regulations of traditional Arabs' poetry. In the Arabs' poetry, they don't say iqtadih. So most of the Mufassirun says this little ha is just for pronunciation, just to make sure you stop at this and breathe. That's literally what they said. Has nothing to do with meaning. That's what they said. It's extraneous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, astaghfirullah, should not have put it in this verb. Why? Because the letter ta refers to the self of the addressee. Conduct yourself. True. That's correct. Iqtadi is based on Arabic grammar. It means you conduct yourself. So what does iqtadih? There is a third person here added to the imperative verb which includes yourself. So you conduct yourself him. Ah, you conduct yourself him. That's literally what it means. It's absolutely stunning and beautiful. This is the Quran and it's telling us one of the names in that list that we read is you. One of the names of that list that we've read is you, Muhammad. You are receiving this imperative verb. You are being told, conduct yourself or follow yourself in accordance with their guidance. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala added a pronoun, a third person pronoun to this imperative verb. This is the Quranic grammar. This is how we learn from the Quran. So the clause, فَبِهُدَاهُمْ اِقْتَدِهُ indicates you conduct yourself him because you and him are the same person who is him it's one of those people in the list so if we say ismail is one of those people in the list it is acceptable to believe that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling muhammad you conduct yourself which is also him one of those ismail in our case according to the huda of all of these people so you conduct yourself according to the huda that was given to these people, including Ismail, including yourself. Beautiful, stunning, absolutely brilliant, amazing use of concealment. But it's right there in plain sight. People who really analyze and look for those examples that I shared with you, these three examples. First one is Ayah 111 from Surah Al-A'raf, knows that the Quran uses H or Ha with the silent diacritical sukun as a third person pronoun. Also in this ayah, 36 of Surah Ash-Shara. Also in this ayah, 28 of Surah An-Naml. So therefore, the conclusion is this ayah fits with all the Quranic evidence we provided. It is not an objection to our conjecture. And thus we have covered six different ways to try to nullify what we came up with as the conjecture or the hypothesis that is Ismail equal Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we could not find any sustainable objection. And this brings us to the conclusion of this part of this segment, which is we provided primary evidences from the Quran, we provided supporting secondary evidences from the Quran, and we knocked off all the possible refutations against our hypothesis and therefore our hypothesis stands valid if you can find any other ayah in the quran bring it possible but i don't think so because the very first direct primary evidence i gave you included four clear irrefutable exclusive markings 
If you remember, that's from the two ayat from Surah Maryam. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَاعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيًّا Four specific markings that are exclusive to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that alone is direct proof, but we didn't stop there. We applied the methodology all the way to try to deal with any possible refutation from the Qur'an. Now don't bring me anything from outside the Qur'an. I know all of the evidence that you're going to bring from this person said, or that person said, or this book, or this Bible, or this version of the Injil. We don't care about this when we deal with the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the authoritative source over itself. I hope this has taught you the depth of applicability of the methodology and how significant it is that we follow through on all the steps. We don't get enamored with the first idea that comes to us, as some people have done, applying the partial methodology they call methodology. We need to continue with all of the possible objections and to seek refutability as per Karl Popper, as you know. So now we move to debunking the traditional story of Hajar, which if you remember is what I started with. I shared with you the story, the traditional story we were taught, the erroneous story, as you know now, obviously it does not hold water at all. So the question is, where did they get this stuff? Where did they learn about Hajar? Where did they make those claims that Hajar and Sarah and she slept with him and she did not like it and she became jealous and where did they get all of this? The answer is initially they brought all of these stories from the corrupted versions of earlier scriptures. I keep repeating it to the point where now you should have memorized this expression from me. That's where they started learning from. And then they invented their own confirming narrative. Pay attention. They invented their own confirming narrative, our own scholars, or the people who wrote the books, not necessarily the people to whom these sayings are attributed. So when we read a hadith by Abu Huraira, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, it doesn't mean that Abu Huraira really told us that story. It doesn't mean that the person who penned that narration was faithful to Abu Huraira or to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's just written in a book. We have no evidence to prove that this went all the way back in writing with historically documented evidence that this is true. Please get it through your head. If it's written in a book, it doesn't mean it's true. Just like if you hear it on the internet, it doesn't mean it's true. But I'm sharing with you all the evidence directly from the Quran, which is true. This is the truth. This is the rope of Allah to which we hold on. So the Quran does not mention Hajar at all. It is not part of the story. The Quran does not mention that Ibrahim had a concubine or had uh, two wives or had two subordinate women. None of that is mentioned in the Quran. Why did they claim that our beloved وسلم, descended from Ismail, even though definitely not in the Quran? They just made it up. They just wanted to give the Arabs the people who stole Islam, if you remember, the dignity of having come from a major lineage of the Prophet. Of course, the Prophet in that case is, is Ibrahim. And as we saw, Muhammad وسلم, is a descendant of Ibrahim. This is confirmed in the Quran as we saw. It doesn't mean everybody from Quraysh is from the same lineage. The Quran never says that. I hope you're paying attention. I hope you're absorbing the implications of all of this. We're going to detail some implications toward the end of the segment. So where did they get this information from? First, from the Islamic sources, there are two primary sources, both of them obviously wrong, as we demonstrated. The Seerah of Ibn Hisham. Yes, the Seerah of Ibn Hisham, who died in 218. This is the primary reference of the events of the life story or bio biography of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Seerah of Ibn Hisham. He died in 218. Well, where did he get it from? Well, he says that it was sourced indirectly from a guy called Ibn Ishaq. This is not his teacher. This is his teacher's teacher. Do we have the original manuscript of Ibn Hisham? No. 
Do we have the original manuscript of Ibn Ishaq? No. Do we know anything about the teacher that was in between these two guys? No. So the answer is, this is just some book written somewhere that made a claim about Ismail and Hajar. Where did that person who wrote those books bring this information from? Allah knows. It is not my responsibility to deny it or refute it. It is just a book. It is not of any authoritativeness against the Quran. The second primary source is in Sahih al-Bukhari and also partially in Sahih Muslim. The two primary collections of narrations supposedly reported to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-Bukhari died in 256 Hijri. That's two and a half centuries after the death of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muslim died even after him. There are three different hadith that talk about the story of Hagar or Hajar. According to Abu Huraira, one of them, this is on page 826. More on this specific hadith in just a few minutes, just hang on. There is a hadith number 3363, a report, not a hadith. Pay attention. And those of you who read Arabic, I'm giving you the number. Go back and check it for yourself. It is not a hadith. It is reported by Ibn Abbas on his own authority. The hadith says, even though it's in Bukhari, the hadith says, Qala Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas said, and then there's a whole long story, two pages long, about the whole life story of Ibrahim and Hajar and Sarah and what happened with this and how, how it happened. All of these details, no reference to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Abbas, how old was he when our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died? Less than 12 years old. And in some reports, nine years old. So Ibn Abbas made that claim. This is according to the best will testimony given by Bukhari. Bukhari does not say this came from our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we don't belie our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam against clear evidence from the Quran. Because we want to honor some written report in some book that was written 256 or 250 years after the death of our Prophet. There's another hadith 3365. It's also a report by Abdullah ibn Abbas, not from our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So these are the three references from the books of hadith. Of course, Sahih Muslim came after Sahih al-Bukhari and took some of the similar reports. There is another secondary Islamic source, which is the first book of tafsir that we have a collection of, complete collection of, which is At-Tabari. At-Tabari himself died in 310. Pay attention to the dates. Where do you think At-Tabari got it from? At-Tabari got it from the same sources that Al-Bukhari got it from, quoting Abdullah ibn Abbas, not quoting the Prophet ﷺ. So it is an opinion given by somebody who claimed that this information or this story came from one of the youngest companions at the time of the death of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, Abdullah ibn Abbas. More importantly, all of these books, all of these records in here, were written during the Abbasid dynasty. In other words, the Abbasid dynasty is ruled by people who claim to be descendants of Abdullah ibn Abbas. So put this in perspective. You are the caliph in this dynasty and you claim that your great great grandfather is Abdullah ibn Abbas. And he said this. Does anybody dare say Abdullah ibn Abbas was wrong? Of course not. So if it's written in a book, who's going to raise his hand and say, no, 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 this is not correct. This cannot be. This is, a, this is an indication Abdullah ibn Abbas is wrong. Do you dare say this at a time where it was very simple to off with your head? Of course not. So nobody objected because nobody dared. So this is where we got our wrong, erroneous story about Ismail from. I hope you're shocked. I hope you're angry. I hope there is fire burning right there, right now, because we grew up learning these stories. And worse, in my 40 plus years of educating people about Islam, I have narrated similar stories, erroneous stories. And I really regret this. Honestly, I'm very sorry to anyone I misled with these wrong stories. 
now that we understand the correct story from the Quran, we have a lot of work to fix the problems we have helped create. So we don't become advisors and guides to the misguidance. So in the video on Allahumma, I challenged you to choose between Quranic evidence and the claims made in collections of hadith. Now I'm asking you to choose again the Quranic clear evidence, irrefutable evidence that I presented and the narrations from these sources that I just described. You have to choose man-made versus what Allah told us. It is a tough test, I know. But take the time to think and reflect and ask yourself, where do I want to put my hand on this scale? On the scale on the side of the Quran or on the scale on the side of man-made narrations whose sources we don't know what authoritativeness they have. So now the next question is, wait, wait, what about Hajj and As-Safa Al-Marwa and Zamzam and all of this stuff? Yes, As-Safa Wal-Marwa are mentioned in the Quran. We don't need hadith for this. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala told us, As-Safa and Al-Marwata are among the signs provided by Allah and thus whoever performs the pilgrimage or Umrah, then there is no harm for him to circumambulate using them, using these two reference points. And whoever volunteers to do so, then Allah is receptive to their communication and a provider of evidence-based knowledge. So here we have clear indication from the Quran about As-Safa Al-Marwa. That's all that Allah told us about them. We don't need to make up stories. We don't need to invent myths and fables and children's story about a woman running back and forth long distance just to find water. And the cruelty of a man called Ibrahim who left her and left her son at the mercy of a place where there was no food, no water, no human beings, no animals, no plants. This is unbelievable cruelty that they taught us about Ibrahim alayhi The Quran doesn't say any of these stories. What about Zamzam, Dr. Hani? No Quranic evidence to that story neither. I'm sorry, but this is the truth. The Quran tells us what we need to know. The Quran does not allow us to make up our own fabricated myths and fables and erroneous stories. We don't need to overload our children with things they don't need to overload themselves with. So is it true that Ismail was Ghulam Halim and Ishaq was Ghulam Alim, all of this stuff? Again, it is not. We will deal with this issue in a future segment. I'm trying to keep the segment to a smaller size. If you excuse the joke in here, it's really not short, but it's very important that I will deal with this in a future segment, inshallah. So the summary so far, we have four primary clear Quranic evidence. There is more. I will deal with them in future segments, inshallah. And there are two secondary Quranic evidence that we presented, a total of six, and six different Quranic ways to verify our conclusion against possible objections. So I don't want anyone to write in the comment, what about this ayah, what about this verse, what about this paragraph, what about this mention of Ismail in association with Ibrahim? If it is something we've already dealt with, please don't write about it. If I see a comment about something I've already dealt with, I'm sorry, I'm going to delete it because we cannot keep repeating and wasting time with things that are already covered in this segment. So please watch the segment from beginning to end. Take the time to learn. It's useful. It's valuable. And if you have additional questions above and beyond what we've covered, I welcome that. I prefer if you send me questions via email marvelousquran at gmail.com so the inevitable conclusion Ismail is none other than our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi I hope it's clear now I have four beautiful gifts for you please pay attention because there are significant implications the first gift is the Quranic methodology that we used as you saw to prove this conclusion that we reached 
can be used to clean up the books of hadith. Yes, that's exactly what I said. And therefore, people who narrated these erroneous hadith about Ibrahim and Hajar and Sarah and Ismail in the chain, I'm not talking about the original companions, very likely should have a question mark attached to their name, at least the last two. Because these are the people from whom those who collected the hadith took from. They're more likely to have been liars. I hope this is clear. This is how we use the Quranic methodology that we applied in front of your eyes in this segment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Amran, إِنَّ هَذَا لَهُوَ الْقَصَصُ الْحَقِّ Don't believe anything else. وَمَا مِنْ إِلَهٍ إِلَّا اللَّهِ there is no deity, source of knowledge, except Allah. These are the truthful stories. There's no deity except Allah. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And Allah is the mighty, the source of linguistic discernment. But if they reject and turn away, فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِالْمُفْسِدِينَ Then know that Allah provides the evidence-based knowledge against the corruptors of scripture. So why are they described as the corruptors of scripture in this ayah? Because they tried for 1400 years, succeeded in corrupting the foundational story about Ibrahim and the importance of Ismail, who is Muhammad Had we learned the truth about Ismail, had this truth not been hidden from us, all sorts of different narrations and different narratives would have reached us. But they succeeded in inserting the biblical version of their story. And our scholars, our books of tafsir, fell for it. They swallowed the bait. I don't say they were liars. I don't say their intention was bad. But they did not understand how significant what they were doing will impact the future generations. The second gift is If Ismail was not the son of Ibrahim in Mecca, then who was that son? And is that story correct? The answer is, I have already given the answer. In the segment titled, Did God Order Ibrahim to Slaughter His Son? It was Ishaq. Ishaq is the first son. Ishaq is the one who is described in Surah As-Safat with that dream. Ishaq is the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed Ibrahim and his subordinate wife to have the first son, Ishaq. Ishaq was not in Palestine. I'm sorry to tell you. Ishaq was in Mecca, as we shall prove in future segments, inshallah. Ishaq is described using another name in the Quran. So when we read about Ibrahim and Ishaq, and after Ishaq, Yaqub, Yaqub is the second son of Ibrahim. This, inshallah, will all be described. But this is a quick answer and a gift to those of you who have been patient all the way through this segment. Gift number three. Our beloved is descendant of Yaqub as well as Ishaq. Yes, that's why he is Zul Qarnayn, the people with the two lineages, as we described in the series on Zul Qarnayn. So in this ayah from Surah Yusuf, which we have talked about before, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ I've given the translation for it a little earlier. This ayah is not only from Yaqub to Yusuf. This ayah is also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he's telling him, Allah shall perfect the ni'mah he gave you, the blessing, the favors he gave you upon you and the followers of Ya'qub. So Muhammad was the last of the descendants of Ya'qub exactly as he completed it before for Ibrahim and the other person from whom Muhammad descended, which is Ishaq. So therefore Ya'qub, which was in Misr as we know, and Ishaq, which we shall prove later inshallah to have been the one in Mecca where the two biological forefathers of Muhammad So Ibrahim had two children, Ishaq and Yaqub, and their lineages spread throughout the world and they came back together with Muhammad 
How did this happen? Why do we say that Muhammad وسلم, was from the descendants of Yaqub? We shall prove this with historical references and you will see it for yourself and you will see it also in the Quran, inshallah. I will leave this detail to a future segment. But this is really important to understand that much of the stories they told us, if not all of them, are bogus, they're lies, they're false. They did not understand how to deal with the Quran and therefore did not extract the correct knowledge from the Quran. Gift number four, this is significant. This is stunning and I need you to really pay attention. This is clear evidence that there were some people in the early generations, probably the second century, who knew exactly what the Abrahamic locution was. I'm going to show you clear evidence. Remember, the books of Hadith were collected during the third century. So the narrations were heard at least during the second century. So during the second century, some people knew the Abrahamic locution and you're going to see it with your own eyes. But it was hidden from us somehow for some reasons. But yet some of the books still contain clear usage, correct usage of the Abrahamic locution. Watch this hadith reportedly in Bukhari. This is the Mazdar, Sahih al-Bukhari. This is the page number or the hadith number 5084. The conclusion is that this is Sahih, deemed Sahih by Bukhari. This same hadith is also reported in Muslim, in the collection of Muslim. Exact wording. Please pay attention. This is so critical. The hadith says Ibrahim lied three times. This is what the hadith says. It is reported through the authority of Abu Huraira, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Huraira is supposed to have narrated that Ibrahim lied three times. The first time, etc. The second time with Sarah, etc. And then at the end of this hadith, Abu Huraira supposedly added the following expression. Please pay attention. This is mentioned in Bukhari 5084 and Muslim 2371 and also in Bukhari 3358. So in three different places, the exact same follow-up by Abu Huraira to the same concept, to the same hadith. The exact wording is as follows. Qala Abu Huraira it's highlighted here in yellow. It's highlighted here in yellow. Those of you who know Arabic should be able to read it directly and be stunned by what you're reading. Qala Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira said, this is after the end of the narration. So the narration supposedly from the Prophet, blah, 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 blah. And then at the end, Abu Huraira added, فَتِلْكَ أُمُّكُمْ يَا بَنِي مَا إِسَّمَا So he's talking about Hajar. Clearly here you see the word Hajar and etc etc and then وَأَخْدَمَ هَاجَر it says and made Hajar her concubine or her slave woman or her servant servant to Sarah of course the exact same description is in both hadith in both hadith or three hadith three narrations at the end Abu Huraira added from his own words his own mind the following expression I'm not saying Abu Huraira did this I'm saying whoever wrote this added at the tongue of Abu Huraira the following expression. And this one, meaning Ajar or Hajar, this woman is your mother, tilka ummukum, your mother, ya bani, or descendants of ma as the water that comes from the heaven. If you have been watching this segment for a long time, you know what as means. It's the layers of understanding. Ma is the divine rain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. Both of these words are Abrahamic locution. Attaching these two words to the word Bani is also Abrahamic locution. Is also Abrahamic locution. So Bani Ma as is Abrahamic locution that represents the believers, the Muslims. So supposedly whoever wrote this report is claiming pay attention is claiming abu huraira said that that concubine is your mother ummukum ummukum not my mother ummukum your mother who you followers of 
the divine water that comes from heaven. This is mocking the whole concept of Abrahamic locution right there in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. Whoever wrote that expression, and I'm not saying it is Abu Huraira. I can't verify it is or it is not Abu Huraira. Whoever wrote this report, however, and delivered it to Al-Bukhari or wrote it in the manuscript of Abu Al-Bukhari had such hatred for the Abrahamic locution and he referred to us, the believers, Bani Ma as sama descendants or children or followers of the water that comes from heaven. You make up your own mind. You tell me whoever wrote this did not intend it as a form of mockery, especially with Ummukum, Ummukum. Do you remember when we talked about Ba'uda? They refer to Rabbukum, Rabbuka, Idhab Anta wa Rabbuka, Hal Yastati'u Rabbuka, as they said to Isa, can your Lord, ud'u lana rabbaka, as they said to Musa, hear ummukum, your mother, not our mother. So this person was definitely not part of the believers. He did not include himself with Hajar as their mother. He was rejecting Hajar as a matter of fact. He's saying that Ibrahim made three lies. How could they accept such hadith? How could they accept such narrations as coming from the companions of our beloved? I have no clue. This is clear right there in front of their eyes. They just don't want to see it. They want to dismiss it and watch in the comments. They're going to accuse me of lying. I'm showing you right there in front of you. You can look it up by number and page number. So inshallah, we have learned from this. So what are the implications of all of this, Dr. Hani? A clear departure in the Quran from the foundational story of Ismail as erroneously told in the corrupted version of the Torah. Why did they do it? Because it's an ethnic thing. Superiority. They want to value themselves as descendants of Isaac. Ishaq. Ishaq is the son of this beautiful, noble woman, Sarai, who became Sarah. And you guys are descendants of this concubine. Ethnic superiority. Our scholars bought it hook, line, and sinker. Not only that, but they fabricated narrations to accuse our beloved and the companions of supporting the same story. The books of Tafsir have not been teaching us the stories of the Quran. They have been teaching us the stories according to the corrupted version of the Bible. They have not been doing Tafsir of the Quran. Those who claim that the current version of the Torah is correct are going against the Quran clearly because not only the story of Yusuf, which we have not seen yet, but every single story told in the Quran, as I demonstrated in the story of Ismail, is dramatically different from those stories told in the Bible, in the Torah. So don't tell me that what we have today is correct, as some unfortunate Muslim sects claim to this day. And watch, they will accuse me and attack me on the comment stream. Because I told you, this is going to create an existential crisis for you. The evidence is right there in the Quran. It proves with no doubt, irrefutable, that Ismail was Muhammad. And yet, you want to attach yourself to the version of the story that came from the corrupted version of the Bible, which is what's available to us today. Those who claim, those who claim that the Quran took its stories from the Bible or has the same or similar stories to the Bible, are deluded and misguided as demonstrated by this foundational story of Ismail and Ibrahim. Modern day Imams, Ustaz, Muftis, preachers, whatever label you want to give yourself, those who took the bait and continue as some of our scholars in the past to teach the biblical version of the stories of the Prophet have a very good excuse now to wake up and join us. Please give up the wrong stories. Surrender fully to the Quran and exclusively to Allah. Learn from the Quran exclusively. Stop stuffing our minds with corrupted myth and fables. Enough worshiping of the forefathers. Enough creating lemmings and cowcubs. And those of you who have been watching this channel know exactly what these terms mean. If these scholars and internet preachers 
don't come forth and disavow the erroneous stories as I am doing right now. I told you I used to teach it and I admit that was wrong. Alhamdulillah, we discovered the correct story of Ismail from the Quran. Now it's time to publicly come forth and say I was wrong. If those preachers, stars, Sheikh, Imam, Mufti, Ustaz, uh, brother this, brother that, all of those people, if they don't stop, I promise you, we will expose them, naming names and showing videos, and with more and more Quranic evidence of their misguidance. This is just the beginning. I promise you, we have so much more to come. We have barely started. All of the stories told in the Quran tell us a truth that is different than the stories that we brought from the Bible, from the corrupted version of the Bible. Is this a threat? No, it's a promise. I promise you, I will stand and hopefully you all will join me and write me in the comments that you will take your part in standing as a witness for Allah against all of them who are corrupting the message of Allah and who are teaching us Torah instead of teaching us the Quran. We will clean up our deen from the harm caused by those who corrupted it in the past and by those who continue to do so today. This is a promise. I want to remind you of this ayah from Surah Sabah. وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتٍ قَالُوا مَا هَذَا إِلَّا رَجُلٌ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَصُدَّكُمْ عَمَّا كَانَ يَعْبُدُ آبَاؤُكُمْ This is exactly the words that are used in the comments that I receive and the hate messages that I've been receiving. And when our signs are recited upon them, our signs from the Quran, I'm reading the Quran, that's all I did. Exposing the truth for what it is. They say this man only wants to block you from what your forefathers worshipped. Yes, I do. Because what they worshipped is other human beings. وَقَالُوا مَا هَذَا إِلَّا إِفْكٌ مُفْتَرَى What this man says is just concocted lies. I showed you all the evidence, all the accuracy in the translation. We pursued every possible lead. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلْحَقِّ لَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ As the rejectors said to the truth when it was delivered to them, this is but manifest magic. Some people are accusing me of being smooth in getting my way to explain ways to solve the problems of the Quran or smooth in lying to people who don't know any better. Sihr, magic. I'm being you know, accused of being a magician. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up for us a new source of knowledge. I hope you take this ayat very seriously. So finally, a severe warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to those who do not make amends as I promised. We shall expose all of those who are making lies about the Quran. And we're going to give them a chance first to repent and to come clean and to confirm that they were wrong about what they taught. We all need to do this. I'm putting myself as an example in that case because I made so many mistakes. And therefore I'm coming forth and trying to correct them to as many people as will listen. I hope you will join me and do your part. إن الذين يكتمون ما أنزلنا من البينات والهدى من بعد ما بيناه للناس في الكتاب أولئك يلعنهم الله ويلعنهم اللاعنون إلا الذين تابوا وأصلحوا وبينوا فأولئك أتوب عليهم وأنا التواب الرحيم. Those who hide what we have revealed of بينات we have just talked about بينات instruments of extracting evidence. And of guidance after we have exposed it for the people in the scripture. As I just did. I carried out my responsibility as a witness against you inshallah. If you refuse to carry this forth and deliver the message to other people. Those who refuse to do this are cursed by Allah. And we talked about cursed. Cursed that means deprived of his direct guidance. And are cursed by those who curse. The angels or as we said in the video about Allahumma, other people who make the wrong dua for you because they don't know to stop using the word Allahumma, they're cursing you. Except for those who cease, stop, follow the divine lexicon and expose what they learn, then those I shall support them in their cessation and I'm indeed the supporter in cessation, the most merciful. 
So finally, what do you do with this information? First, praise Allah. Say Alhamdulillah. Please write me in the comment. Tell me that you got the message. Tell me how you feel. Take the time to enjoy it. This is great news because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is choosing this time to open up so many new things that have been kept secret from us or hidden from us for 1400 years. Something good is happening. I hope you enjoy it. Alhamdulillah, one of the huge clouds has been lifted. Yes, clouds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as blankets that have covered up our eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is lifting them slowly but surely. And I hope you join me in being happy about this. That was obstructing the vision of Muslims. Inshallah, some great news are coming forward. Second, write in the comments something that expresses your feelings. Don't hesitate. I want to hear from you. If you don't want to write in the comment, write me in the mail through MarvelousQuran at gmail.com. I really enjoy to receive your stories and listen to what's going on in your life with regards to what you receive through this channel. So please write me. I love to read them and I love to have companionship because it's like we have been all allowed to come out of the closet for the first time. We've been all harboring these secret thoughts. And we're afraid to express them. And this channel is giving so many of you a way to come forward and say, me too. I believe in this. I believe in what Allah is revealing to us at this time. Third, share this video with all those who are teaching the wrong interpretations of the Quran, especially the last five minutes. And tell them I am making a promise to come after them unless they fix their ways and amend their ways and stop teaching the wrong things about Islam. Fourth, prepare yourself for more. I promise you, we have just started. We have barely touched the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot more to come, inshallah. With this, we come to the closure and we make the dua that we always make. Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah laqad jaat rusul rabbina bilhaq I thank you so much for watching. Salamun alaikum.